Thank you very much. My name is Milos Sharamek. I am from the Society for Open Information, Information Technologies, and I will continue in Slovak because this is an announcement of an, of an event which, is, which will be held here in this area in a month. Takže ešte raz po slovensky, moje meno je Miloš Šrámek, som predsedom spoločnosti pre otvorené informačné technológie a o mesiac na uh, v, uh, Univerzite FMF UK sa, sa uskutoční Open Source Weekend. Je to predn- prednášková akcia dvojdňová, odznie tam 26 prednášok s témami od veľmi všeobecnými, napríklad čo nového sa chystá v distribúciách Red Hat alebo OpenSUSE, až po veľmi špecifické technické otázky administrácie. Ja to tu mám napísané pre istotu, ale nemám okuliare. <laughs> Proste. Dozviete sa mnoho zaujímavých vecí o svete otvoreného softveru. Jedna z sekcia bude venovaná open source hardwareu. Budeme tam mať témy ako je Arduino a open source hardware všeobecne, plus bude tam workshop, kde organizátor donesie asi 20 Arduin a keď si donesiete svoj, svoj počítač, svoj laptop, tak môžete sa s ním pohrať. Veľkú časť budeme venovať otázke nasadenia otvoreného softveru v organizáciách a teda niekoľko prednášok bude tomuto venované a venovaných a v sobotu podvečer sa uskutoční panelová diskusia, kde viacerí ľudia, ktorí s touto témou majú, majú skúsenosti, budú hovoriť o týchto svojich ins- i- i- skúsenostiach a možno aj o tom, že čo by mohla štátna správa v tomto štáte urobiť preto, aby trošku ušetrila z tých stoviek miliónov a použila ich potom nejakým rozumnejším spôsobom, ako vyhadzovať na zbytočný software. Ďakujem pekne. OK. Uh, so I will start. I will talk about uh, PyCon PL. Um, that's the list of PyCons in Central Eastern Europe. Um, actually, PyCon PL is the oldest one, so it was started in 2008 already. Uh, Slovak one is the youngest one, but I'm very impressed by all the organizers' work uh, on the conference. It's really good for a first uh, conference. is a big success. Uh, so PyCon PL, uh, it's a conference that moves from place to place, and probably noticed that uh, the names of the places aren't big cities. So uh, we had the general idea that uh, we will organize conference in the uh, small town villages instead of big cities, but in hotels, of course. Mm, and we are uh, generally always looking for a big hotels so we can fit all the attendees uh, in one hotel. So usually it results in making PyCon PL in uh, such kind of places. Uh, and what are the advantages for the attendees? So first of all, you don't have to worry about your last tram bus uh, leaving or that you forgot something in the hotel and you need to go back. Mm, you generally don't need to worry about weather because you are staying in the hotel, so you don't need to move uh, outside, but if you want, you can go hiking. And everything is close, uh, and thanks to that, that uh, all people are in one place, there's a great uh, opportunity to socializing. So uh, that's the uh, official date for PyCon PL 2016, and uh, it's the first place uh, where this date is publicly announced. So. Uh, it wasn't known earlier what will be the, the date this year. So where exactly is PyCon PL? <laughs> it's in a village uh, called Osa, where there's a huge uh, hotel complex that can even fit uh, 1,000 people in rooms. So uh, it's one hour from Warsaw, and you probably ask um, how, how far away it's from, from Slovakia, from Slovakian cities. So from Bratislava, it's around six hours if you travel by car. Uh, from Košice, it's uh, similar. But uh, if you do not plan to go by car, uh, you only need to reach Warsaw, as we are, uh, we, we from, the, from the last year, we started to organize bus transfers, so you can use them. Mm, and to reach transport, you can use trains, or you can 
if you want the super cheap option, then you can pick a direct bus line from Bratislava to Warsaw, and uh, return uh, ticket costs around 30 euros, so it's very cheap for such a long distance. You can all, all, also take some flights. Uh, so PyCon PL, uh, lots of tracks, uh, lightning sessions like here, uh, from six to seven uh, hundred attendees we are expecting this year. Last year we had over uh, 500. And the full ticket includes hotel, uh, which is four star, and uh, meals during the conference. We are uh, cooperating with organizations uh, that are promoting diversity in or organizing the conference. Um, we also had lightning talks, you see, PyCon SK was advertised during the last uh, PyCon PL. A lot of people. Other activities, we have a coding contest when you can uh, win uh, valuable prizes. So last year you could win drones, smartwatches, and uh, uh, smartphones. Mm, we have board and card game nights. Uh, this year we will have a retro zone, so with the old computers and consoles. There's al always a grill barbecue on Saturday. Uh, if the weather is bad, then uh, it's the grill dinner. Um, so, um, some photos from the PyCon PL, so you can have a feel how it looks like. A lot of uh, um, games, some Czech people playing also. Uh, some workshops from Agile with Lego. Uh, that's the place, how it looks, so the restaurant. There's a free swimming pool, jacuzzi, sauna. Uh, there's a bowling pool, so a lot of attractions and opportunities to uh, Mm, to integrate. And the full price with the room is, I would say, it's quite cheap for four days. It's around 200 euros. So that's all. If you don't have the money, apply for financial aid. So, hello everyone. Mm, I guess this is the first speak today and yesterday that's done from an Android device. And what I would like to talk about is how to easily run Python uh, on an Android device without root with Stockroom, without any difficult modifications, and completely open source. So my name is Yuri Bayer, and uh, let's start. So uh, recently I've discovered uh, a tool called Termux. It's a single user Linux environment, or Linux-like. Uh, it's a terminal emulator and multiplexer, so you have multiple consoles at the same time. It requires, unfortunately, Android 5.0 plus, uh, but it doesn't require root. Uh, it provides um, Debian package management. So basically, you have apt. You can download from a remote repository a list of packages, install it uh, over internet, upgrade them, etc. And uh, it has some extras like Android widget, which can uh, invoke actions within this environment, and uh, wrapper for Android API, so you can, in theory, have access to uh, sensors and stuff like that. The homepage uh, is termux.com. Uh, it's available for download from fdroid.org or Google Play, but as this is open source application, uh, fdroid is the preferred way. Uh, this is a, uh, a screenshot uh, or a picture taken from the Termux homepage, uh, showing just basically uh, m an Android phone with uh, four cores running uh, colored top, so it looks very fancy. And basically, uh, the Termux provides a package for both Python 3.5 and 2.7. It's available on the repo immediately for download. Mm, pips, pip works out of the box, git as well. It's again available as a Debian package. Um, there are some basic editors, Everything is text-based, but encurses are supported. So beyond Vim Python and Nano, we have also MCEdit. Uh, and as the application is running as non-root in the Android environment, we have only higher ports than 1024. But the traffic is uh, available. The traffic or the applications running in the environment can communicate with uh, Android applications like browser. Um, the file system is a little bit unusual but it breaks uh, shebangs, so uh, there need to be uh, some hacks to, to make it work, but um, it's, it's usable. Uh, 
goodies useful for uh, for working with uh, Python in this environment is Bluetooth or Hacker's Keyboard, and it's possible to team uh, the Bash and syntax highlighting in Unite Commander. So what I would like to show is really quick live demo. So this is a running uh, Termux environment. First of all, uh, if I type apt update, it's connecting to the network, apt upgrade. It really shows something and it starts downloading and installing. So before it finishes, uh, PWD, uh, it's visible that I'm not in uh, the regular uh, hierarchy for Linux systems, but rather Android. And uh, another quick demo, this is Midnight Commander with syntax highlighting tuned for Python syntax, so it looks like base, base 16 uh, dark. Uh, and the last very short demo is uh, this very short application, it's actually a Flask demo app, so it doesn't uh, do anything more than Hello World. But if I start it, yeah, it's running, and then switch to Android browser. So, oh, once again. So now I'm connecting to localhost 5000, and hopefully it will serve the Hello World. But as it, as it crashed, I'm not sure if it, does it do? 404, but it's only a icon. Yeah, it works. So that's it. So uh, several times uh, when you manage your Django settings, .py files, uh, maybe you have uh, there uh, some uh, settings for more machines and uh, it gets too messy. Uh, so for this, uh, there is one simple hack uh, I have found once, uh, and it is creating the directory from the file settings.py, and of course you need to get there the init.py. Of course there should be uh, underscores, but uh, this uh, environment uh, eat that, uh, and in that I, I need .py file, uh, you can do some magic things. For example, uh, you can decide uh, on which environment you are operating and uh, import another files in that settings, that, uh, in that settings uh, directory. Uh, and in this way, uh, you can uh, manage it and uh, it doesn't get so messy. Uh, this uh, is also usable on another places where you need to have a lot of uh, specific, uh, some specifics in one file. You can just uh, split it into more files uh, in one directory which have uh, in init.py. Another flash, which <laughs> I hope will enlighten you, <laughs> for example, uh, is uh, about NumPy, uh, which uh, we're told about uh, today morning. Uh, and there are also some uh, 100 challenges which aren't so easy. Uh, the first ones, yes, but the, the, uh, when you are going down, uh, there are more hardcore examples uh, when you can see uh, some ways to use uh, this NumPy, how to work uh, more quick than you could understand sometimes because there are hacks which are possible. So that's another one. Next flash, there are also NumPy challenges. Uh, yes, I am NumPy developer. Uh, not NumPy itself, but uh, I'm using NumPy for developing some software. Uh, and the last <coughs> thing, uh, you can use, for example, this uh, uh, IPython notebooks for presentations also. Uh, for example, this way, it can create slides. And this one package, and be present. This is it, it's GitHub, uh, can be used for that. So for example, if you want, you can try. Thank you. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Rodolfo, I work for Red Hat, and? I'm Tatiana, I work for Education First in London. 
Okay, we are gonna talk to each other because we have five minutes to spend. So, <laughs> Tatiana, what are you gonna do tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow I will come here to join the coding dojo. Yeah, what's that? Well, it's a kind of activity where people practice pair programming and we train tests and we learn best practices. We can learn more about Python programming and eventually we might even solve some problems together. Oh, that sounds really cool. I really want to learn more about TDD. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll probably join you. How much does it cost? It's for free. Oh, it's really? It's free of charge. Oh, great. <laughs> so what time are we starting? We should start around 9 and yeah. it will be from 9 to 12. We will be here. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, what else? Oh, we still have time, right? <laughs> yeah. How's it, what how about you? Have, have you ever joined any coding dojo? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, actually, back in 2008, I was in PyCon in Brazil, and I had my first coding dojo there. It was incredible. It completely changed my life. And we started a coding dojo in Rio <laughs> that runs every Wednesday. And it's so, how many years since then? Eight yeah. years. Well, that's crazy, right? Yes, if they're keeping it, it's a good sign. It's you know what? I also it. started a coding dojo in, in Brno. It's been eight weeks so far. So if you are a Czech guy, well, maybe talk to me and I would like to meet you in Brno for a dojo. How about dojos in London? Well, I've joined around two of them, organized by random people, and they are, were quite awesome as well. Yeah. So there are a few meetups around the the city where you can join and learn and interact. Mm. Yeah. So great, guys, if you don't know what to do tomorrow, so come join me and Tatiana for the coding <laughs> dojo. Thank, Thank you. you. So hello, I'm Mira. This is, uh, this is Harris. We want to tell you something about porting DB. This is not porting DB. This is a uh, Python free ball of superpowers. Uh, you might know this actually is the list of um, favorite packages from uh, Python package index, and uh, they are sorted by downloads, and they are green if uh, they support Python 3, which is pretty cool. As you can see, the first few of them are green, and if you don't scroll, you can get the idea that everything is fine. The problem with, uh, with this list is that not every Python thing uh, lives on package index. A lot of apps don't live there, and also a lot of, uh, for example, if there is a C library or a C++ library that also generates uh, Python bindings, they often are not to be found on Python package index. And we are from Fedora, and uh, we love Python 3, and we hate Python 2, and we want to make uh, the world uh, the same. And we want to port all the uh, Python packages to Python 3, but uh, of course not only by ourselves, but... Uh, we need more contributors for that, first we of all. And secondly, the newest Fedora version will actually have by default Python 3. Python 2 is considered actually legacy at the moment, somehow at least. Uh, all the new features will be in Python 3 at the moment, not in Python 2. Okay, let's show so the porting DB. Porting DB. It's a project from one of our colleagues, actually, which tracks from the Fedora port from the Fedora package database which packages are actually upstream ported in Python 3, which are being worked on for Python 3, or and which are actually not being worked on. Uh, the I blue thing is just jump there. Uh, you cannot see it, but the URL is portingdb.xyz. It will uh, redirect to Fedora porting DBXYZ because in the future maybe some other distros will join us. And yeah, okay, go on. Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, anyway, the green bar is the packages that are actually ported at the moment. Uh, yellow bar or the things as you can see, it's 26 packages actually at the moment being ported in Python 3. Uh, related regarding the blue bar is. There is some problem with the RPM. Upstream actually supports Python 3, but maybe the packager has not done a very good job on supporting or providing a Python 3 sub-package. So there are some issues with that. We always need more people for or packagers to do this work as well. Uh, the other bar, the next bar, is the idle packages. Packages that are only in Python 2 at the moment are not being worked on. So anyone can actually choose a package, 
pick it up, start working on it. Uh, the red bar, the most important one, is blocked packages. So some dependencies are actually not ported, so that means these packages cannot be also ported to Python 3. And the rest of it are packages that are not going to be ported to Python 3 because not gonna be used or things like that. So we also have some groups of packages. Uh, so if you are interested in, I don't know, Fedora infrastructure or KDE spin, you can see it for the groups. Uh, our main thing is Fedora Workstation, uh, the Fedora desktop, the Fedora with GNOME. And since uh, Fedora 23, which already has been released, uh, Python 2 is not on the media, or it's not defaultly installed, because all our tools there are running on Python 3. And, but you can still install Python 2 from the repos. We have only one minute, so I'm gonna try faster. Uh, those are packages being worked on, and if you scroll down, you can see bugs and everything, links uh, about information, and you can also scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, and see all the packages that, are, uh, that have problems, and then you can pick some package to work on. If you scroll a little bit back up, you can see a manager-friendly graph on the right. Uh, we have 40% packages ported, uh, but it's not a big number, but uh, the packages are growing up, and uh, the not ported packages are usually some crazy stuff like WAF extract, which extracts uh, sounds from JPEG images, and nobody uses it. And we also have a dependency graph. Be fast, show the dependency graph before they clap. And you can see which packages depend on what ones, and they form clusters. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Yurai. I apologize because this is one and only uh, talk, uh, which is not about programming. But I know that the lightning talk can be about anything. Uh, I'm sorry. I hope I, I, I don't need five minutes. <laughs> So this is about any, uh, uh, something else. Uh, yesterday I came home from uh, PyCon and uh, my son came to me. Hi dad, I have a homework. I have to set my first uh, email address. So I turn on the laptop and uh, while we were setting up his first email address, he's 10, so maybe, maybe it's too late, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he's really, really much into snakes and reptiles. And my wife asked him, uh, hey, Dominic, you, you told me once that uh, snakes, some snakes, they, they do have uh, legs. And he said, well, yeah, not actually. They, they have, it's just uh, spurs, it's, it's remnants of legs. So actually, they, they have like uh, small legs. So my message is, uh, Python itself is quite impressive, uh, animal and also language. And uh, but there's more if you see under the surface because in X-rays you see the legs. So uh, dive into it. Thank you for coming and thank you for all of you for uh, supporting uh, PyCon SK. Thank you. So hi, I would like to tell something about the, uh, the information about Data Sprint. Uh, we are starting tomorrow at uh, ten, and I would like to wel welcome people who would like help port. Uh, the data dispatch, what we actually need, people who are interested in the FreeBSD and Mac OS X and uh, can help port the uh, Jesus patch to these platforms, and also people who know how to compile code on Mac OS X can uh, join us and it will help us as well. So, thank you. So, image, 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 uh, image let's try to image uh, that you, you, ha you are trying to write some tests for your precious model in Django. This is small model, which is called person. It has name, phone, and job. And when you are writing some tests on it, let's see test. You have to test, you, you create person, and you, you should test that the person has some name. So, and what, where, and when to or get some sensible names. Unfortunately, there is Python comes with batteries included and there is a library for that. So the library is called fake, uh, faker. It's in module fake, fake factory. So on the beginning, you will import faker. Then you create fake factory. And if you can ask your fake factory to generate fake data for you. For example, name. 
great. It created a name for me. When you ask another name, it will create another name. If you, for example, need some phone number, create a phone number, another phone number. If you need some company name, no, company, another company. If you need job title, job title. <laughs> if you need some bullshit, it's there too. <laughs> So how you can connect your fake factory to your uh, tests. And for th there is some other library for that. It's called uh, Mummy or Model Mummy. It will, you will just take, uh, you will just create Recipe. As you, my mummy has a book of Recipes, so you will create Recipes too. So you will create a file named Mummy Recipes, and you will say, uh, I have a Recipe for normal person, and it will be created for like person. Uh, if you will, if, if you don't fill any data, any fields of the of the Django model, it will create totally random data, which is bad because you don't want to name your people. <laughs> so it will be better to create per, create people by this this way. So the name will be created from a fake factory name. Phone will be created from fake fo phone number. Job will be created as a, as a fake job. If you have some expensive expert, you will just say, I will take normal person and change this job to bullshit. No problem. <laughs> and then I will Im try to import some. I created test application. I imported recipes. This P is a person. P name is there. It's still there because I haven't created another person. Well, one minute, great. People. When you need more than one person, for example, you need a group of programmers, you will say quantity is free. Now I have three people with different names, I hope. Four P in people. Three random people. It looks much better when you are uh, running Selenium tests. And finally, here is a way how to run it in uh, uh, just a normal test case. You will import your recipe, create person as a people, and then test the name is longer than four characters. And now I manage test. Runs. It's great. It's all. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, maybe you've heard about this module in Python 3 that's called AsyncIO. Uh, I still get some really smart people coming to me and saying I don't really get what it does. So uh, maybe I can explain it in five minutes. Uh, and I will uh, request the help of Blinky here. Uh, you can see Blinky. This is Blinky. Say hi to Blinky. Uh, here's Blinky source code. So it, it's pretty much a class that has a set face method, which sets a given face, and uh, you can print it. There's a printing function that you know that actually prints it, and you can run Blinky, and it sets some face, and then it waits a while, then it uh, sets another face. The problem is Blinky is sad because he doesn't have any friends. Uh, so uh, let's give him some friends. Uh, this is the same code, except it, there's more blinkies. And for creating more blinkies, I use what uh, a clueless programmer would do, and I used some threads for them. So uh, there's a thread for every blinky. Uh, there's a print function that uh, just prints all the blinkies with a space between them. Uh, and this is this is really good. Uh, it's not you know web scale. It's just eight eight or nine blinkies. Uh, when I you know upgrade this little print blinkies function to the enterprise ready uh, <laughs> print blinkies two point uh, uh, or two point oh, uh, this one adds a little time sleep between printing each blinky, and there's a problem. It doesn't print really well. Why is that? Because when I sleep, 
other threads come in and start printing the row of blinkies again, and it completely ruins my display. Uh, if you work with threads, you will run into this problem quite often. Uh, you can solve it with locking, uh, but you, in a complex program, it's hard to tell where the lock should go. Uh, you cannot solve it with things like greenlets, if you know G event or things like that. This kind of stuff will still happen. And for that reason, uh, Node.js got really popular for solving this problem, and they solved it in this way. So here I have two functions, close eyes, and open eyes, and uh, each one does whatever it's supposed to do, and then it adds a callback, and there's some event loop going, and uh, each function runs and tells that the other function should run in some set time. Uh, and in Python, we have we have you know async IO for that. You can use uh, Twisted, which is probably nicer for it. In Node.js, you have the JavaScript syntax, so you can put one function easily in the other one, uh, which might work for simple cases, but in harder cases, it's really complicated. Uh, the problem here is uh, these two functions form a loop. It's really you know a trampoline to recursion, but what we want to do is a loop. And that is a problem that uh, async IO and the async await keywords in Python 3.5 set out to solve. So if I rewrite that to an async function, I have a loop. And here it says, uh, you know, sets face, and then uh, it awaits from sleep. So this says, uh, this thing can block, uh, anything can happen here. Uh, any side effects will uh, from from other you know like threads of execution can happen here, but everything between the awaits uh, will not get interrupted. So I can be sure that if I use an enterprise ready set face 2.0, which has some side effects, uh, I can be sure that nothing will. Uh, I don't know my time, that nothing will interrupt and nothing will get in my way. And if set face needs to interrupt, it needs to change to an async function and I will need to call it differently. And at that time, I need that I, I need to rethink my logic and see again if, uh, if that is okay with me. All right, uh, so everything works. Thank you.